to work. It seemed to me that homeopathy presents really the greatest scientific challenge. Um, within our thought structure, it seems completely implausible. Uh, and yet the worldwide demand and the patient experiences seemed so dramatic and persistent across time that I felt it was a puzzle that really had to be solved. So I decided to investigate this strange therapy and one of the aspects I looked at was the historical background. I was quite stunned. The system had been developed in a progressive manner for approaching 200 years. I found medical journals published in continuity for a century and a half. I found many apparently learned and skilled physicians writing up case histories reporting success and serious life-threatening infections. And leafing through one of these textbooks, I realized if 5% of this is true, the implications are absolutely stunning for the population and for medicine itself. Nevertheless, um, I came to the conclusion, I must be honest, the biased conclusion that I was looking at one of the most fascinating structures built around suggestion and goodwill and naivety that the medical world had perhaps ever seen. But he decided to put homeopathy to the test on hay fever. A standard treatment for hay fever, in fact, uses a homeopathic principle that like cures like. Conventional doctors tried to cure hay fever by injecting grass pollen to build up immunity. Homeopaths use the same idea, but in pill form and in infinitesimal amounts. Homeopaths claim that if you dilute this pollen in a particular way, it continues to be active at levels which we would say are impossible, beyond Avogadro's numbers, as in technical language, uh, really ridiculous levels of dilution. So although uh, hay fever was the disease, the issue was these so-called potencies or extreme dilutions. These two bottles here contain the medicines. So in 1983, Dr. Riley tested two bottles of identical pills on over 30 hay fever sufferers. Unknown to them, only one of the bottles had been dosed with a few drops of the homeopathic remedy. The other contained just dummy pills. You'll fill out uh, this line, as I described, a visual analog scale that will score just how bad the hay fever has been that day. His volunteers were asked to keep a daily record of their hay fever symptoms while taking first one bottle and then the other. Dr. Riley fully expected his trial to prove that any benefit from the homeopathic remedy would be due to a placebo effect, that it was all in the mind. <coughs> but the study showed that remedy worked. Unfortunately for me and my thinking at that time, it yielded a positive result, a statistically significant positive result. So I took the attitude, something has gone wrong here. This is impossible. And I said, let's rerun this study. So all, all and any criticism that was offered was incorporated in rerunning the study. And it was run in the year later on a much grander scale, five times more patients and all sorts of inbuilt measures against bias or fraud or any other possible explanation. Every diary was examined by an independent assessor from the University Department of Medicine who verified the data against the computer printout. He signed this, put, placed it in a sealed envelope and delivered it to the statistician. He checked this paper against the disc he'd received and analyzed the results triple blind, as is known in the trade. He didn't know which group was which. The result was a surprise. Again, the homeopathic medicine demonstrated itself as being greater in effect than the dummy medicine. In fact, the homeopathic remedy was 15% better and indeed quite as good as many conventional hay fever treatments. So does that prove homeopathy works? It's completely artificial to expect one trial to prove or disprove such an important controversy. One looks across a broad spectrum of activity and see if the critical mass of evidence is moving towards a resolution of this problem. Christopher Day is a homeopathic vet. He's a leading figure among a growing number of British vets who have turned to homeopathy, and his experience with it provides another important piece of evidence. Although conventionally trained, over the years he has come to reject conventional drugs and now relies mainly on homeopathy. I qualified in 1972 from Cambridge University, and after 
a few weeks in practice, I was tempted to try some homeopathic remedies on some chronic cases. And I found to my surprise that a percentage of them were responding in a way which I never thought was possible before. And from then on, really, it's been a slippery slope. I'm afraid I've gone on deeper and deeper. Oh, Gunny. All right. All right. We've obviously got to try and stimulate that nerve to heal and reduce the bruising around it. And uh, that way she'll have a chance. Broadly speaking, the advantage of homeopathy is the lack of side effects in that, uh, especially in the case of chronic disease, where you can envisage long-term treatment with drugs, which even with the mild drugs will produce side effects. With homeopathy, we are free of that danger. So we're talking about a, a tremendously safe system of medicine. And all that it requires is to know that it's effective before it becomes correct to use it. And we've certainly proved the effect in chronic cases here. And this is Kim. As with humans, homeopathic that, um, diagnosis for animals that. includes personality. Do you feel that she is much happier anyway in the cool? In the cool, yes. She is herself. Does she have any fears? People? No. Are the dogs all right? Yes. For the last five years, Kim has had a skin condition which conventional vets have been unable to clear up with drugs. And in desperation, Kim's owner has come to Christopher Day for help. She's very good, isn't she? No, she is. I don't think she's really enjoying this. This particular case is very typical of many of the skin problems we see. And it has been on steroid for quite a long time with diminishing effect and it is still self-mutilating, it is still scratching and biting, has these tremendous sores on the back and has lost a lot of hair. And what we intend to give it is sulphur because this remedy in fact fits most closely the picture that's presented by this dog in terms of its character and its likes and dislikes and the skin lesions that we're seeing. And I've chosen the 200th centesimal potency, the 200C, because I feel that this will suit the case best in the power that it will give. And this is the remedy diluted one in a hundred, two hundred times. So we're talking about a remedy, well, sub-molecular. And I anticipate it would have quite a beneficial effect on the case. Three months later, Kim was brought back for a checkup by a grateful owner. There's a good girl. Ready? Shall we turn around to the light a minute and see her a little bit better around there? For the first time in years, the skin problem looked considerably improved. Now, how's she been? Well, as regards the general condition of coat, she's 100% better than when we had her before. And just up here, it seems to have cleared up tremendously well, doesn't it? Animals are meant to be less suggestible than humans. So do successful cases like this mean that homeopathy might not be all in the mind? I think the sceptics will often level the argument that the apparent healing effects of homeopathy will be down to a, a mental process, that it's all in the mind. And this so-called placebo effect is a word that's often used. And where you could imagine perhaps a small amount of this occurring in a, an owner-pet bonding relationship, I fail to see how, when the large proportion of my work is done on farm animals, large herds of farm animals, dosed via their drinking water, how we are going to convince them that they're going to be healed and therefore have a mental process that's healing them. I fail to see how that can be all in the mind. Like most country vets, Christopher Day has to survive in the hard commercial world of the farm where sick animals cost money. A major loss for milk producers is an infection of the udder called mastitis. As Day became more confident with homeopathy, he decided to offer farmers a new mastitis treatment. He told them they could help prevent mastitis by adding a few milliliters of a homeopathic remedy to their cow's water supply just once a month. I was very, very skeptical. When he told me it's just a matter of putting in a few drops of water into a trough, I thought, how on earth can it work? But um, actually doing it has proven to me that it is very successful. Um, the savings on the herd is incredible. Just by putting five milliliters of water, as it looks like, into the water trough once a month is saving me a thousand pounds a year. So that has convinced me. I'm not skeptical anymore. The new homeopathic treatment for Peter Reed's cows has saved him that much money because the normal treatment for mastitis ends up being pretty expensive. Vets normally prescribe antibiotics, which must be repeatedly injected into the udder until the infection clears up. The reason the orthodox treatment is so costly is that for days afterwards, the cow's milk must be thrown away because of the antibiotic residues. But these days, for Peter Reed, that problem is rare. 